I'll be reading a selection from book two of The Way of Thorn and Thunder, Weirwood. This is from chapter eight, Thresholds. Even with her eyes pinched tightly closed, Dinara couldn't avoid the dawn, as the single sun's first light cut through her consciousness like forge heated needles. She groaned with overdramatic emphasis and pulled her pillow over her head, but there was no escape. She'd forgotten to lower the curtains before falling into bed, and now the morning's brightness was everywhere. She couldn't quite bring herself to face the dawn today, or any day for that matter. She normally slept until mid-morning, or early afternoon if she'd had spirited company the night before. Once awake, she generally found it impossible to go back to sleep, at least until later in the day, when the lush interior of her brightly colored wagon would be a welcome... Uh, would be a welcome respite from the prairie's afternoon heat. Though the cool shadows of twilight were long gone, and though she was well aware that sleep was past, the curvaceous strangeling lingered in bed for a little while longer. When she mustered the courage to finally open a bleary, sleep-crusted eye, she let out another groan and slid back under the silken coverlet. The wagon was a mess. Overturned crockery, half-drained jugs of various local and regional wines, a partially eaten loaf of bread, and a rather pungent piece of white-skinned cheese covered the narrow table and bench, and miscellaneous articles of bright, perfumed clothing were scattered on the floor, chairs, tables, with the most intimate articles hanging from her cabinet doors and draped over the head of the small statue of a strutting peacock. As her thoughts came together through the haze of wine-addled sleep, the last items brought a flash of recognition to her face. She sat up, slowly, and stared at the three shapes slumbering in the bed beside her, their well-muscled chests rising and falling softly, sun-bronzed limbs wrapped tightly together, slightly damp locks curled and pasted to their foreheads. As the pleasing memories of the previous night's events slowly returned, Dinara shook her head, wincing as a pounding headache announced itself with the force of Gverg war drums. Farmhands, she berated herself. Sun save you, Dinara Serene. What's the appeal? She lifted a corner of the blanket and gave the young men a more thorough appraisal. She couldn't help but grin. It all made perfect sense now. Gorgeous farmhands and triplets, of course. It took her a while to disengage herself from the firm, sweat-moistened knot of arms, legs, and other fleshy appendages, a struggle she didn't particularly mind. But she eventually managed to stumble to her wardrobe and into a tight-fitting emerald dressing gown that she'd chosen specifically because the striking hue matched her eyes and complemented her dyed auburn hair. While her guests remained soundly asleep, Dinara stepped outside into the already warm day and walked barefoot to the oak stayed barrel at the back of the wagon. The water within was ice cold and clear. She squeezed her eyes shut and took a deep breath before dunking her head. She rose up again, sputtering and gasping, and finally felt the morning's mind fog clear away. She had forgotten to bring a towel, so the water streamed down her face and neck and pasted the clinging gown to her skin. Now fully awake, she idly considered waking up her young guests to show them how transparent and form-fitting the wet cloth actually was. Given their performance the night before, she had no doubt that they'd be more than eager for a frolic before breakfast. She was half inclined for a pinch and a giggle herself. But with full awareness came a sudden knot of unease in her chest that had nothing to do with the glistening tangle of luscious man-flesh in her wagon. Dinara turned to the east, toward the Everland. The caravan was in the southern stretches of Aramar, miles away from the southern edge of that ancient territory of shadowed forests and reaching peaks. But she could always feel the Greenlands calling her back. It had been years since she'd been home. She shared her parents' mutual restlessness, and she'd long ago given herself to the road and all its unpredictable ways. Hers was a sometimes wearying life, with too few opportunities to sit and enjoy the quieter side of sociability. 
Her temperament wasn't much suited to domesticated pleasures nor to tradition, and her father's people had no great love for a strangeling who seemed bent on following the wild ways of her human mother far more than the grounded kin teachings of her father. Over the years she'd found many places to call home, at least temporarily, and Bremen and Crow's medicine show and repertory of thespian delights was among the better of them. She didn't stick out as particularly frequent as particularly freakish among this motley company of actors, acrobats, musicians, and minor miscreants. And her various mundane and marvelous skills were quite useful for a group of wanderers who, on occasion, skirted both propriety and legality. This life would do for a while, at least until she could get back to the marble-lined streets and gilded, gilded domes of Shalimore, the greatest city of men in the Reach. It was the one place besides the Everland that always called to her, and it was the only call she happily answered. The ways of the road could be lonely, but it was better than feeling a foreigner in your own homeland. Still, as the tightness in her stomach reminded her, Dinara would always be tied to her birth home through blood and history. She could keep running for the rest of her life, but she'd never be free of the Everland. It would always inhabit her, twisted deep within spirit and memory, no matter how far the road might stretch. And the closer she came to the often unseen barrier between the reach of men and the lands of the folk, the clearer that link became. Yet, yet as she looked off to the eastern horizon, squinting her eyes against the hot sun, a trickle of fear crept down her back. The boundary between the haven of the folk and the world of men wasn't unseen any longer. She could see it just fine now. It was smoke. The border of the Everland burned. <laughs>